To gain a deeper understanding, let's analyze and visualize these intermediate steps in our collab environment. So let's dive into this section. Before we start, let's briefly talk about why letterboxing is essential for image pre-processing. First, it preserves the aspect ratio. Directly resizing images can distort objects, but letterboxing keeps their proportions intact by resizing proportionally and adding padding when necessary. Second, and one of the most important reasons, is to ensure model compatibility. Models like YOLO require input images to have dimensions divisible by the model's stride, like 32. This is crucial because the convolutional layers operate on a fixed grid. If the image size isn't divisible by the stride, it can cause misalignment and lead to inaccurate detections. Letterboxing ensures the image fits the required dimensions. Additionally, letterboxing helps maintain detection accuracy by preserving realistic object shapes and makes batch processing smoother by ensuring all images share the same dimensions. It's a simple yet vital step for optimizing object detection. As you can see, I've added detailed comments throughout the letterboxing code section. This is because there are a lot of important details to consider, so be sure to check the comments next to each code line for a deeper understanding. First, we're going to load the image we downloaded earlier, display it, and print its shape. Next, let's move on to the next cell where we'll calculate the scaling factor and resize image. This is a crucial step. We compare the target dimensions, 640 by 640, with the original image's shape and select the minimum ratio to make sure the largest side of the image doesn't exceed 640. Then the image is resized proportionally to maintain its aspect ratio, in our case resulting in a new shape of 480 by 640 height and width. Now, let me show you something. If we had chosen the max aspect ratio instead, our resulting image shape would have been 640 by 853, no longer meeting the maximum of 640 limit in both dimensions. This highlights the importance of using the minimum scaling factor to ensure the image fits within the desired size. Now let me walk you through the code that handles the padding after resizing. First, we calculate the padding needed to reach our target dimensions of 640 by 640 by subtracting the resized images dimensions from the target dimensions. For example, we need 0 pixels of padding in the width, but 160 pixels in height. Next, we check if we've set the auto flag to true for automatic padding adjustment. If it's on, we ensure that the padding values are divisible by the model's stride, in this case, 32. We then divide the padding evenly across the top, bottom, and left, right sides to center the image and make sure everything is balanced. Finally, we apply the calculated padding to the resized image using OpenCV's copy make border function, filling the padded areas with a gray color. This results in an image that's properly sized and padded if needed. Next, to better visualize the image flow and shapes, I created this helper function to display the progression of the images through the letterboxing steps to solidify your understanding. If no padding was added, we only display the original and resized images. Otherwise, if padding was applied, we also show the final padded image. In our case, the auto flag is set to true, meaning the image is resized to the minimum bounding rectangle while preserving the aspect ratio. If it were set to false, the result would be a padded image instead. To better understand the difference, we can visualize the image flow by displaying the processed image. Let's try one last experiment. Suppose our input image has dimensions that are not exactly divisible by 32, for example, 800 by 1050. After resizing, the image would become 488 by 640 to fit within the target dimensions while preserving the aspect ratio. With the auto flag set to true, the resized image would then be padded to 512 by 640. Here's why. The target height is 640, and the difference between the target and resized height is 152 pixels. Since 152 isn't divisible by 32, the remainder is 24. To make the height divisible by 32, we add 12 pixels of padding to both the top and bottom. You can visualize the effect of these transformations by examining the image flow here as well. I hope this section clarified the steps, different scenarios, and importance of letterboxing in object detection. Now that we've covered the concept, let's reset to our original values and settings. With this foundation in place, we're ready to quickly run the process in VS Code. Let's dive in and run through the code a bit faster since we've already covered this. First, we calculate the scale ratio. 
Using this ratio, we resize the original shape to compute the new dimensions. Next, we determine the padding needed to fit the resized image into the target shape. If scale fill is enabled, the image is stretched instead of padded. Otherwise, the padding is adjusted to be divisible by the stride. If centering is enabled, the padding is split evenly on all sides. Finally, we resize the image to the unpadded dimensions and add borders using the calculated padding values filled with a gray color. Our labels dictionary is empty, so we skip these steps. If there were labels, we would have updated the ratio pad and labels accordingly. Once that's done, we return the image as we've completed the pre-transformation process. Next, we convert the image from RGB to BGR and change its format from batch height width channel to batch channel height width. The image now has the shape of 1 by 3 by 4, 80 by 640. We ensure the image is contiguous in memory, then convert it into a PyTorch tensor. The tensor is assigned to the appropriate device and its pixel values are converted from unsigned 8-bit integers to floating point precision. Although IM is now a tensor, we set the not tensor flag to true earlier. So we step in here and scale the floating point pixel values from a range of 0 to 255 to a range of 0 to 1. Finally, we return the tensor image in the required format. Once this is done, we'll profile the time taken for the pre-processing step by calculating the delta time and then move on to the next section. In the inference section, we initiate the next profile and call the inference method, passing our recently generated tensor IM along with any additional arguments. The inference method prepares to run inference on the input image IM handling optional arguments for augmentation, visualization, and embedding. It checks if visualization is enabled and saves the results to a unique path if needed. In our case, these additional arguments are set to false or none. Finally, the method calls the model with the appropriate settings. The forward method runs inference on the YOLO multi-backend model. This line unpacks the dimensions of the input tensor IM into four variables, representing the batch size the number of channels, the height, and the width. Next, the input tensor IM is passed to the model for inference, along with optional flags that control behavior. Since X is a tensor and not a dictionary, we bypass any dictionary-related logic and directly call the predict method. We skip the augment step and proceed into the predict once method, where the actual prediction is made. This code begins by creating three empty lists, Y, DT, and embeddings, these will store outputs, processing times, and embeddings, respectively. Next, the code loops through each layer of the model. It takes the output of the previous layer and uses it as the input for the current layer. The loop starts by passing our input image, X, into the first stage of the architecture. At this point, we skip over the profiling step since profile is set to false. 